Hi, I'm Larry Linville, good old ferret face from MASH, and you're listening to The Ken Barron Show on WJBC. I think I just said that, but it doesn't make any difference. The reason I guess we heard from him is because I believe, Dwayne Hickman, you have worked with Larry Linville, haven't you? Yes, yes, I worked when I was at CBS. I supervised uh, the production of MASH, and I got to know everybody on MASH. Yeah, Dwayne Hickman, good morning. It's nice to talk to you again. And I hear it's 31 degrees. <laughs> it's a little cool, a little cooler than where you are, I'm sure. Santa Monica, California, it's about... 55, maybe going to be 65 today. Wow. There's, uh, well, you've spent many of your years out there in California, haven't you? you? Born here, yes. And, of course, I worked here in the uh, early 40s as a little child actor in movies. Went on to do the Bob Cummings show here, and uh, Dobie Gillis was made here. So I've been here most of my life. That was Love That Bob, wasn't it? Yes. Well, it was It was originally the Bob Cummings show. And then when it went into syndication and reruns, they called it Love That Bob. But most people today know it really is Love That Bob. And his secretary was Ann Davis, who was on the Brady Ann family. Ann Davis uh, played Schultz, and then went on to play the, the maid on the Brady Bunch. Right. And uh, she's around. In fact, I think she wrote a book, too, or is going to write a book, cookbook or something. She's, she's busy. I know she's uh, very active. Yeah. Speaking of books, Forever Doby, The Many Lives of Dwayne Hickman is out just in time for Christmas. Great timing on that, Dwayne. Yes, yes, that was the idea. It's, it's a wonderful book. It, it traces my career from, as I say, as a child, all the way through Doby Gillis and all the reruns and the movies like Cat Baloo and on past that, and to I, work for CBS, and, and work on shows like MASH, WKRP, All in the Family, and Designing Women, my favorite show. Then I left CBS. By the way, we spoke uh, in 87 when I was doing the reunion movie, uh, Bring Me the Head of Dobie Gillis. That's right. Then we, I went on and uh, directed and acted. I directed Designing Women and uh, other shows. So I've been very busy doing a lot of different things. That's why we call the book The Many Lives of Dwayne Hickman, because I've had so many things I've done in my life. Yeah. You know, you talk about child actors, and in many cases, some of them are, are bitter, I guess. I know we, we're tend to, we tend to believe that if you're hearing Bobby Blake talk, I guess, about his... Oh, I know. They're very bitter. I, I'm not bitter about being a child actor, and maybe it's because I was uh, not so successful. There weren't a lot of pressures on me. I mean, I didn't really care much about acting. Uh, my brother, Daryl Hickman, who's three years older than I am, he was uh, much more prominent as a child than I ever was, and uh, it was maybe better for me because I was kind of in the background and, and preferred that. I mean, I remember hiding behind the sets, you know, so I wouldn't have to be in the scenes. I was a little kid, little six, seven-year-old, and I was very shy and very quiet, and it didn't mean a lot to me, and maybe that's why it didn't hurt me. You know, Bobby Blake, he did a lot of roles. Didn't he play... Uh, a uh, little beaver to Red Rider or something. I think you're right. I think he was in that. Uh, of course, I think of him in the Little Rascals. But then, of course, he went on to. Uh, was he in that too? Yeah, he was one of the Little Rascals. Oh well, see, then he had a lot of work when he was a small child, and uh, I think it's worse. I think it's harder on the kids. More responsibility, more pressure. Yeah. I didn't have that, and I, I my big break came when I uh, got the part of Chuck McDonald on the Love That Bob or Bob Cummings show, and that was. Oh, gosh, that was in 53 or 54. I was like 20 years old. Yeah. See, I have a daughter that would love to be an actor, and I keep trying to talk her out of it. Well, it's a hard life. It really is. It can be very difficult. I mean, it's rewarding, but it can also be kind of tough. Yeah. There is something about seeing your name up on the screen, I suppose, or seeing yourself that, uh, well, in fact, makes some people cringe, doesn't it? They don't, they can't. I, I still cringe sometimes. I mean, I, I look at old Dobie Gillis reruns, and sometimes I enjoy him. If I can disassociate myself, you know, if I can be objective... But if I think, gosh, why did I look that way, or why did I say it that way, or what did I what, then it, it's very self-conscious. It's like hearing your voice over a tape recorder. It can be hard on you, you know? Yeah. I love the uh, film. You mentioned Cat Ballou, and you, you talk about Lee Marvin in your book here. Uh, Cat, Cat Ballou is one of the best westerns I think ever made. Yes, well, of course, it's a big comedy western, and I, I am not really a western type. But uh, I was in that, of course, because it was a comedy, and I was able to ride the horses and shoot guns and then the whole thing outdoors, yeah. right? My career working indoors on in the <laughs> situation comedies. Yeah, you got to play sort of a drunken minister in there, didn't you? Well, yeah, I was only drunk in one scene. Lee was drunk in all of them. Lee Marvin had a tendency to drink a lot. And uh, in the movie, he played Kid Shaleen, the drunken gunfighter. And, of course, in real life, he was... Uh, a person who tended to take drinks a lot. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> Tending to. I'm being very kind, but he was a character. I remember one story, if I can tell a quick story. We were leaving Canyon City, Colorado, to return to the airport. We did, we'd been filming there, and uh, we were told to be ready to leave at 6 a.m., and we were all down by the station wagon 
to get in the cars to go to the airport, and there was no lease, so they went to his room in this motel and found him. He was stretched out on this bed from the night before, fully dressed in his uh, Western clothes, and they kind of got him up and packed his bags, and he, he got up and put on a, a bathrobe, and in one pocket of the bathrobe, he put a bottle of vodka, and in the other pocket, he put a bottle of tonic. And then he uh, put a lady's hairnet over his head and dark glasses on. Now, if you get a picture of that, <laughs> he's fully dressed underneath the bathrobe, and out he goes toward the station wagon. So he gets in the car, and he's sitting there, and he turns to me, and he says, Would you like a drink? And I said, Oh, no, thank you, Lee. It's a little early for me. It was about 6 a.m. <laughs> yeah, a little early. Yeah, I said, it's kind of early. I No, thank you. So he says, I'm going to have a vodka and tonic. So he pours the vodka into the tonic bottle and shakes it and then starts drinking it. And at this point, we're driving along the highway, the station wagon, the guy's driving us. And Lee reaches into this knapsack and pulls out a forty five automatic, a gun, and he checks the clip and he rolls down the window and there's, there's cattle grazing along the highway. And he begins shooting out the window of the station wagon. With real bullets. With real bullets. And I want to tell you, there was a lot of wide eyes in that car. We just looked at him, you know. Yeah. And finally hit this uh, one steer that was there, and it fell over in a clump. And he said, hot damn, I got me a cow. And that was that was one of the experiences with Lee Marvin. Wow. Wild man. I had heard, I was uh, up in, uh, I guess it was Eureka, California, and I think in that area he and uh, Richard Burton made a film shortly before Burton died. That mu- yes, they did do a film, and that must have been fun, those two guys. Well, that all I heard was how drunk they always were. Isn't that awful? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> all the people, this was about a year later or six months after it happened, and all the times people that I ran into were talking about it. That's all they probably <laughs> talked about, because they were both famous for that, you know. And yeah. Geez. Anyway, it's all in the book, and I talk about a lot of the people I worked with over the years. It was a funny movie, though. I have to ask you about using John Wayne's dressing room when we come back. Okay. Okay. Dwayne Hickman is on the line. The many loves of Dwayne, uh, many lives of Dwayne Hickman. It was, it was the many loves of Dobie Gillis, right? Did you? I, this is really a stupid question too. When we come back, but did you ever sweat the, the problem of acne when you were a kid? You know, you were. Yeah, and the, and the reason I asked that was most of us didn't want, you know, the, the teenage years were awkward, and of course that was part of the humor of the uh, the Dobie Gillis show, right? Yeah. Uh, not that I ever noticed any kind of a complexion problem at all, but uh, there's always that threat, isn't there? When uh, I never had much problem with that. Uh, but Dobie was a typical teen, you know, and he uh, one of the reasons the show was so successful is that Dobie Gillis was a spokesman for the teens. It was the first show about teens from the teens' point of view. Mm-hmm. I mean, I sat there and talked about the problems of being a teen in front of the thinker statue in the park, doing my monologues, and and it was really the first time there was a teen talking about teens. Yeah, didn't I see where the statue just recently was sold? Well, it was sold a while back. Amy Heckerling bought it at an auction. You know, she's the producer who did uh, Baby Talk and uh, Fast Times at Ridgemont High, and she bought it. I've seen it in her house. It's at the end of her living room in a big picture window, this great big... A paper mache thinker statue. Yeah. Rodin's thinker. <laughs> We're going to be back in a minute. Speaking of houses, too, Dwayne Hickman has been in uh, uh, Cecil B. DeMille's home watching films. Very comfortable evening as he paints the picture. We'll, t- we'll talk about that in a moment. Okay. AM 1230 WJBC is proud to bring you Wesleyan Basketball. Puts at the clock, fires up a desperation three, which is good. It's unbelievable. Play up, is good. Foul is called. Stuffs it. Off the alley oop pass. Wide open three. It is good. Good. The Titans. Free game of Wesleyan Basketball is sponsored by Reed Sporting Goods, by Schooners, by Country Companies agents Steve Peterson and Roger Herman, and by Greg Zavitz, your Coldwell Banker, Heart of America Realtor. Play-by-play action brought to you by Citibank and by Ed Manahan, your State Farm insurance agent. Post game sponsored by Clemens and Associates, by Carmody Flynn Funeral Home, by Carol Willis of Remax Twin City Realtors, by Denison Toyota and Denison Used Car Center, by The Travel Company, and by Denny's Donuts and Bakery. Illinois Wesleyan Titan Basketball is heard exclusively on AM 1230 WJBC. Whether it's a shopping trip to Chicago, a riverboat gambling getaway, or an evening at the theater, make your holiday travels unforgettable by calling Glen Payne's Elegant Limousine at 888-4900. Elegant Limousine features limos for six or eight passengers, and they even offer the luxury limo coach that will seat up to 18 people. Plus, Elegant Limousine has many specially priced packages to a variety of holiday destinations. Call Glen Payne's Elegant Limousine at 888-4900. That's 888-4900. 
there's a truckload of prizes at Superwash. A holiday giveaway is going on, so stop at your local participating Superwash and register to win a new 95 Ford Ranger truck. $70,000 in cash and prizes will also be awarded. Besides registering for great prizes during the holiday giveaway, the Superwash automatic tokens are at a super low price. Four for $10. That's a $6 savings. Register now until January 8th at your participating Superwash at 1705 Eastland Drive, 907 Morrissey Drive, or 1901 South Morris in Bloomington. It's uh, 11.17 in the morning at WJBC. I don't know. Are we getting into territory we shouldn't? You were in St. Charles not long ago. Everything's, uh, no, it's in the book, actually. It's the worst experience of my life. There's a chapter, and the heading of the chapter in the book is, uh, While Trotting the Boards, I Died in Chicago. Actually, what happened was, I played the Pheasant Run Playhouse in St. Charles, Illinois, twice. Once, sure, we know where that is. Yeah. Once in the 60s, I did a play called Drink to Me Only. It was fun, and I was fine. I went and rehearsed and played and so forth. Another time in the 70s, I was called by an agent who said uh, they need a replacement for Don Murray in a show called Call Me By My Rightful Name. And I said, well, I don't know uh, what kind of a play. And they said, oh, you'll be fine. And I said, well, when do I do it? And they said, you know, day after tomorrow. Uh oh. So they sent me the play and a ticket, and I got on the airplane, and I was reading this play, and it was like 90-page play, and I was in every scene. <laughs> I arrived there to rehearse, and I had like three days to rehearse the play, and I never did learn it. I never could learn it. I was totally wrong for the part. It was a three-person play, and it was the most horrible, worst experience of my life. And everybody else had their parts already blocked and memorized, right? Of course. It's in the book, and it's very funny. I have this fist fight with this local guy, Chicago guy, who's about seven feet tall, and I'm supposed to beat him up, and <laughs> like five foot nine, you know. And it's just unbelievable. It's so, it's a, it's a Embarrassing, <laughs> funny, and embarrassing and awful, but it's in the book. And I think, <laughs> Did the audience like it? Oh, they got up and left. <laughs> few that were there at the end, just sort of, there was like a little bit of applause, like token applause, and then they got, you could see people shaking their heads. It was awful. And you live with that memory forever, don't you? It's the actor's nightmare, going out on stage and not knowing the play. Yeah. <laughs> you actually lived it in real life. <laughs> it was a terrible experience. <laughs> I want to, you know, for years I wouldn't go to Chicago. <laughs> <laughs> I want to talk to you about uh, using uh, John Wayne's uh, dressing room. Of course, John Wayne was a big, big star. It was a star, and it was a movie called Tall in the Saddle, a western. And I was a little town's kid. I mean, I was in, you know. I remember you in that. You wore a kind of a hat, didn't you? And yeah, yeah. And uh, uh, so we had to make a wardrobe change. I was only about ten. And uh, nine or ten years old, and uh, they said, uh, change your clothes. And my mother said, uh, you know, there's no, you don't have a dressing room when you're a little kid like that. Uh, and I was an extra. I didn't even have a speaking role. So she says, well, we'll go into this dressing room and change your clothes. And I said, well, whose is it? And she said, it doesn't matter. We'll just be in and out. So we go in this dressing room, and we're changing clothes. And in walks John Wayne. It's his dressing room. And he looks at me standing there in my white jockey shorts, you know, this little kid. <laughs> and my mother says, oh, we'll be on just a minute. We're changing clothes. And he said, okay, and gave us that look, you know, like, that'll be the day. And out he went. And we finished quickly, and we went out. My mother said, go over and tell him you're sorry. So I was embarrassed, and I went over and tugged at him. And he said, yeah, kid. And I said, Mr. Wayne, I'm really sorry for using your dressing room. It wasn't my idea. It was my mother's idea. And he said, oh, don't worry, kid. It won't be the last time that you'll do something that a woman will want you to that you won't want to do. <laughs> I can almost hear him say that. Yes, yes, yes. Well, that was my experience, John. He was a nice man. He could have been very unpleasant about that because that's one of the rules of show business. You do not go into the star's dressing room. Yeah. I, I, I had a chance to date. The very first girl I ever went study with was John Wayne's cousin's daughter. So. Oh, yeah. Well, I had my brush with greatness right there, I'll tell you. Uh, absolutely. Because his real name was Marion Michael Morrison, and he came from, you know, the middle... He's a good guy. He really was. Middle part of the country, sure. He appeared to be on the screen. A very nice man. You know, when you think about the dressing rooms, though, that's one of the bones of contention, isn't it? Uh, who's the bigger star? Who has the biggest dressing room and all that? Dressing room. It used to be. I don't know if it is so much anymore because they don't care. They give you the dressing room. It's the money they don't want to give anybody, you know. <laughs> You've actually seen some of Hollywood change over the years, haven't you? You've been in the game long enough. Quite a bit. You know, TV's very different today. Uh, back when we did our shows, uh, they were very individual and special, and, and the networks and studios kind of left you alone. Today there's a lot of influence and interference from the networks and from studios, and the shows all kind of begin to look the same, if you notice. Mm -hmm. 
television it, isn't as different as it used to be. It's kind of it has a sameness about it. There are some good shows, however. Yeah, there really are. Uh, I think Murphy Brown's a good show. Murphy Brown, that's one of those uh, productions that uh, yes. you worked with, really, huh? Yes, I worked. I didn't directly work with that. It's but it's a Linda Bloodworth Thomason. No, that no, Isn't it's it? a Diane English. Linda Bloodworth Thomason did Designing Women and Hearts of Fire. She's got a new show, Woman of the House. She did uh, Evening Shade. Oh, okay, yeah. yeah. I like that show, too. I thought that was good. Yeah, that was a nice show. And uh, I got to know Harry and Linda, and they were very nice, Linda Bloodworth Thomason and Harry Thomason, and they let me direct their show, as I said. And uh, I met a lot of nice people, and uh, it's been interesting for me since I left CBS because I've been able to go direct other things and do other acting. And yeah. had a very and, and writing this book was a lot of fun because Joan Roberts Hickman, my wife, uh, who is a writer also, she and I wrote it together. We wrote it sitting on our bed here in, in longhand on yellow pads because we don't have a computer. We don't have a word processor. So we kind of wrote it out and then had it typed because we don't even type. <laughs> it took like forever. And yeah. we have a two-year-old, Albert. Uh -huh. Albert Thomas is two years old. And, of course, he was only like six months old when we started on the project. And we did the writing around his naps and then later, you know, Winnie the Pooh and Barney. Mm -hmm. So it was quite a long, drawn-out experience, but we didn't want to work. I didn't want to work with a ghostwriter. I wanted to work with Joan, and she's a wonderful writer. So I'd recount these stories, and we'd talk about my career, and then she would write it out, and then I would go back and say, well, no, that's not true, and it didn't quite happen that way. Let's change this. Let's add that. And it took a long time, but the outcome is that the book really sounds like me doing a monologue. It really is my book, you know what I mean? Almost like the start of the Dobie Gillis show. Yeah, rather than uh, where you'd work with a ghostwriter and you'd just uh, tell the ghostwriter everything you had to tell him, and then he'd go away and write the book for you. Yeah. It wasn't like that at all. And that's why it's gotten such good reviews and is a very special book. It's uh, 11.24 in the morning. We're talking with Dwayne Hickman about his autobiography, or should we say semi-autobiography if your wife helped you? Well, semi, but we, we wrote together. It's unusual that a, a couple writes together, but we've written uh, movie scripts and TV scripts. She uh, wrote and sold uh, shows for uh, Designing Women. Joan's been writing for a while. She's really very, very good. Okay. But it's still an autobiography. We'll be right back after this. It's what you've always dreamed of in a pre-emergent corn herbicide, a product that controls both grasses and small-seeded broadleaves all season long. One that works in dry weather as well as wet. And one that performs across all soil types and tillage systems. Introducing Harness Herbicide from Monsanto. Not only does Harness handle over 40 of your toughest grasses and small seeded broadleaves, but it also offers you something that's missing in most pre-emergent corn herbicides. Consistency. Harness works in all sorts of weather, in all types of soils, and in every kind of tillage system. Simply put, Harness delivers the consistent season-long control you need for cleaner fields and bigger yields. So this year, ask your dealer for Harness Herbicide from Monsanto and discover why Harness is a weed's worst nightmare. Always follow the label, Harness is a restricted-use pesticide. Premier Page invites you to imitate Santa. That's right, Premier Page gives you expanded local coverage so your pager will cover the area better than the big bearded one covers it on Christmas Eve. Plus, you'll get free activation and rental for three months of unlimited airtime for under 50 bucks. Or if you want, own your pager and enjoy free activation and six months of unlimited airtime for just over 135 bucks. Either way, it's much cheaper than a flying sleigh ride and much more practical, too. Visit Premier Page in Schnooks Plaza. Premier Page. Wherever you go, there we are. <laughs> Need some help with ideas for the special people on your holiday gift list this year? Let College Hills Mall get you started. Let the staff at Vanity help you select a party dress perfect for New Year's Eve. Wrap up a stack of hot CDs at Musicland. How about treating yourself to a new hairstyle for the holidays at Studio 301? Be sure to remember College Hills Mall gift certificates. They're always in style. Create holiday magic for someone on your list. Shop from over 60 specialty stores at College Hills Mall, Veterans Park, Greener College Avenue, Normal. We have Dwayne Hickman on the line, and uh, it's fun, because I'm, I'm certainly uh, the sort that would watch the, the Dobie Giller show, but uh, I do recall you in things like uh, Cat Baloo and some other things, and I'm impressed in the fact that uh, you were able to uh, do all these transitions, because not many people can. Some kids are actors, and by the time they grow up, uh, they're out of the business, and there's no way they can get back in. You've, uh, you've really had your hand in a lot of different things, haven't you? Yeah, I, I, I wanted an education. I went to Loyola University, and even when I was doing the Bob Cummings show, I continued going to classes, and even though I dropped out in my senior year, I later went back and got my degree. So, you know, I tried to be diversified so I wouldn't have to depend on just acting. Yeah. Know? 
Like now, I write and I direct and I do other things. We talked about how times have changed. I don't know if Hollywood parties are like this anymore, but you got invited over to uh, the Cecil B. DeMille home, right? Yeah, I thought you were going to say Gary Cooper, whose house I used to. I used to well, we could, we could touch. Could you stick around a little longer than this half hour? Sure. I'm going to put you on the spot here. I was going to say if somebody had a question for you, they could get to you. But there's so many stories in this book, and we're just sort of skimming the surface. If anybody wants to ask any questions, that's fine. Do you, you mind sticking around for another 15 minutes or so? Not at all. Okay. Uh, we are almost down to news time. But let's can we touch on the uh, Cecil B. DeMille story? Because I think this shows... dating this girl whose family were, were friends of DeMille, Cecil B. DeMille. And he was much like... Uh, now you say Cecil. Is, it, is that right, Cecil? Oh, if it's Cecil or Cecil. I, I don't know. Okay. I call him Mr. DeMille. <laughs> And uh, anyway, I was a kid dating this girl, and her family was invited to his house. It was in the Los Feliz area of Los Angeles. It's an area, an old area. And, of course, he had this great big house like Sunset Boulevard up on the hill. And he used to invite people over, family and friends and neighbors, to see movies in his projection room. So I got invited along, but I soon learned that when you went there, you kind of kept your mouth shut, and you didn't comment on the movies till he did. That was kind of an unwritten rule. So you'd go and you'd take your place and you'd sit in this big projection room like in the movies. And in he would come in his sport coat and tie and his uh, writing pants, you know, Mm -hmm. outburst. And he'd uh, motion to the projectionist and they'd start the film. Nobody said a word. And then when the lights came up, there'd be big pause and then he'd say, well, I like that movie. And then we'd all turn and say, yeah, I like that movie that was a good movie. I liked it. And if he said, I, I didn't like that movie at all. I think it needed a lot more work. Then we'd all turn and say, well, I didn't care much for it either. I, I, you know, that was the thing. You, <laughs> didn't, you just kind of stepped away from him and agreed. <laughs> the, reg- the original yes men right there, huh? The original yes men. Anytime you're ready, Mr. DeMille. <laughs> Showed the kind of power the guy had, though. What clout, huh? Oh, incredible. And it was, uh, you know, from the old days of movies. The guy started directing silent movies, and he was a big deal. Yeah, and then, of course, he did the Lux Radio Theater. Yes, he was he was kind of pleasant. I mean, he was, you know, I was a little kid, in, and I was sort of quiet, and I just said, yes, and no, Mr. DeMille. So. Yeah, I remember him doing the introduction for the uh, Ten Commandments. Mm-hmm. Came out. And they didn't do that very often in film, but you actually saw the director address the audience. Yeah, yeah. Oh, he was quite a character. Yeah. We're going to continue, if that's okay with you, Dwayne. Oh, sure. All right, we have about five minutes' worth of news. Dwayne Hickman is on the line. If you have a question, 829-2345 is the number. He has a new book out, and uh, it's just in time for Christmas. It's uh, Forever Dobie, The Many Lives of Dwayne Hickman. Hot air ballooning is something most people say they'd like to do. Ask Sandy Brown of Bloomington. She recently took her first hot air balloon adventure with Captain Walt of Aloft Horizon. It was absolutely wonderful. We saw a coyote running through the field. We plushed two pheasants, which were absolutely beautiful. Once again, he swooped us upward, and we saw three beautiful deer running across this farmer's field. And it was so peaceful and so calm... If you think that flying is wonderful, you must try ballooning. It's like you're suspended in the middle of nothing. Aloft Horizons Hot Air Balloon Adventures are unique gifts for the holidays. Owen puts the bloom in blooming time. This is George Burns advising you to stay tuned to the Ken Burns Show. 21 in front of noon, George Burns. Uh, you know about George Burns. For George Burns. In fact, he was, wasn't he a backer of uh, one of the shows you did? He was a partner with Bob Cummings in the Bob Cummings show. And uh, he, three guys, uh, George, uh, Bob, and uh, Paul Henning, who later went on to do the Beverly Hillbillies and Petticoat Junction and Green Acres and all those shows. But uh, George was very involved in the making of the Cummings show. He used to come and watch our run-throughs. We would rehearse, and then at the end of the day, he would come and watch us run through the whole show. And he had comments and notes and opinions, and he was very bright, very smart. Did a good job for the show. Yeah. He's, uh, he's one of those guys, too, you don't think about it, but I think he had, uh, he owned part of Hogan's, no, that's Ben Crosby, I think, owned part of Hogan's Heroes. Crosby owned that. Uh, but d- let's see, Mr. Ed, wasn't that a Bob, or uh, George Burns? He could have been. He had a very active production company, and of course, he really knew comedy. I mean, he started in Vaudeville with Gracie. He was the perfect straight man. Yeah. We made a reference to the fact that you uh, dated Gary Cooper's daughter, and were, you were at a party there at his house. Yeah, Maria, uh, she was a lovely young girl. I was her first date many years ago, back in the 50s, and I met Gary Cooper, who was really just like on the screen, a charming, charming man, very likable guy. But there was a big party I was invited to at his house, and all these people were there, like uh, Clark Gable, and uh, I remember Rosalind Russell. There was a, she and her husband were there, and I remember there was a little uh, curbing, like around a fireplace, and inside, underneath the fireplace, was water, like about half a foot of water. 
and she was standing talking. She fell into this pool <laughs> by the fireplace and got her evening gown all wet. <laughs> uh, Cooper and I helped fish her out. Yeah. And she went in the other room and put on tennis shorts and stood around the rest of the evening with everybody in, in tennis shorts. <laughs> kind of an unusual home, anyway, huh? Usual, yeah. Yeah. Gee, who are, you know, we're talking with uh, Dwayne Hickman, by the way, if you just joined us. Uh, Dobie Gillis, uh, you were almost typecast by that, uh, that role. That was so successful. Why the title Forever Dobie, no matter what I do in life, I seem to be known as Dobie Gillis, and that's okay, because, you know, in fact, I was at a party. Harry uh, Thomason and Linda Bloodworth Thomason invited us to a reception for, at that time, Governor Clinton, Bill Clinton. And uh, I met him at this party, oh, several years ago, and he turned and said, my gosh, it's Dobie Gillis, you know, and he said, I've always been a fan of your TV show. So I've gotten this all my life from just about everybody. So that's why we picked the title Forever Dobie. But I also wanted to add in the many lives and all the different things I've done with my life other than just play Dobie. Dobie was on 59 to 63 and, you know, has really been running ever since in reruns. Yeah. Let me take a phone call. If you have a question you'd like to ask uh, Dwayne Hickman or a comment you'd like to make, feel free to give us a shout in the next few minutes while we still have him on the line. 829-2345 would do it, or uh, 1-800-322-9377. I may have somebody right here. Good morning. You have a question? I don't believe so, but anyway, if we have another minute or two you can get in. We'll just uh, put the offer out there. 829-2345 or 1-800-322-9377. Of all the people you've met, and of course, you, you, I guess when you're working, you do tend to run in those circles, you know. Yes. Um uh, are there people that really, really impressed you and some people who you wondered about? Uh, I know you and Tuesday Weld. No, I never got along that great with Tuesday, but I tell you, she was a wonderful actress. She still is a wonderful actress, and she was great in Dobie Goes. She played Thalia Manager, but, you know, she was very young. She was about 15, 16 years old, and I was in my 20s, and I was very serious about the show, and I, I wanted to rehearse all the time, and I was kind of picky, and she was kind of petulant and pouty and kind of spoiled. So the two of us really didn't hit it off all that well, but she was great in the show. And, of course, Warren Beatty played Milton Armitage, the rich boy, and he did about four shows. And for years, he, in his uh, biography, it never mentioned that he was ever on television. He, he denied that he ever appeared on television, and, of course, those shows are running and have <laughs> book, by the way, has kind of jogged his memory because... Uh, his amnesia has left him because some uh, press agent came out and said that he does remember having been in Dobie Gillis. <laughs> Maybe he just wanted to forget it. Yeah, yeah well, I, I know he did. He didn't want to <laughs> own as a person who started in television. Okay. Good morning. Do you have a question? Whoops, an open line there at 829 We may be having a bit of a problem with the phone. I don't know. But if you'd like to get in and ask Dwayne a question, feel free to, uh, free to do it. Uh, we talked about the John Wayne dressing room, Carrie, uh, Gary Cooper's daughter, Maria Cooper. What was Gary Cooper really like? He was never really very outspoken, was he? Pardon me? Uh, Gary Cooper wasn't very outspoken, was he? Oh, very quiet. He didn't talk much. Just kind of yep? Yep and nope. He was kind of like on the screen. Very quiet man. 